So good afternoon and um, good morning for those who are in an earlier time zone. Thank you for joining us on this session um, discussing how you can eliminate and manage oracle seed and taxes. And the aim of the session would be to also um, provide some insight into what is meant by this word taxes. Um, today I'm joined uh, by Craig Arenti, the global CEO of Palisade, and we're hoping to make this an informative and conversational discussion um, on this topic. So with any further ado, um, let's have a brief look at the agenda. And uh, today we're going to look at um, what is the important dates in the Oracle calendar, how we can negotiate, how we can uh, make sure that we avoid any wrong transactions or deals with Oracle, and how we can deal with um, audits that we might not be familiar with or that might not be visible to us. And then a little bit about what happens up to May and beyond and how in the different requirements that you might have, whether it is you're needing to negotiate a contract with Oracle, you've got support renewals due, you, you might even have um, received an audit letter or thinking how to deal with an unlimited license agreement. So all of those topics we will um, cover here today. And if you stay till the end, you most probably will be in um, for a little bit of a reward uh, and a surprise. So uh, please stay with us if you can. So the panel today, as I've mentioned earlier, consists of Craig Arenti and myself, and um, I'm just probably going to open it up here to Craig. And maybe Craig, you can give us a little bit of a background about your Oracle life and uh, your experience. Sure thing, Anna Rita. Thanks for having me. I think this is our first, we've worked together for so many years. It's, I think it's our first webinar together. Uh, yeah. So this, this is great. <laughs> and you have to turn on your video so people can see you. You're oh. hiding back there. Um, so as, um, as you can see on the screen, um, I've spent a lot of time in the Oracle ecosystem. Um, as a matter of fact, this is my 99th quarter uh, dealing with Oracle challenges and issues. Uh, the first 16 years uh, were with Oracle and the last nine or eight or nine years have been with uh, Palisade compliance. Uh, so I ran Oracle's global contracts and business practices teams um, had about 1,200 people working for me all over the world, um, in, including folks all throughout APAC. Uh, I was also the global process owner for Oracle LMS, the audit team, uh, and was on a few advisory boards, uh, customer advisory boards that Oracle had, um, and then left Oracle to, to found Palisade uh, to sit on the other side of the table helping customers with those same Oracle challenges uh, that we helped build uh, while we were at Oracle. And uh, last year, I was excited that we opened up sort of an education arm of Palisade. Uh, we call it Palaversity. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Thank you, Craig. And uh, just a little bit background um, for myself. Uh, as Craig mentioned, we've worked together over the years. And, um, you know, it was quite enlightening for me joining Palisade, being able to sit on the side of the fence, so to speak, and uh, being able to help organizations um, really have control of the Oracle licensing and um, Palisade being an advocate in that space um, for you. So just a little bit, and we're not gonna spend a lot of time um, around Palisade and Palaversity. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Palisade and what makes us a little bit different. And then um, I'll ask Craig to talk about, as he's mentioned, our new um, initiative, Palaversity. So Palisade Compliance is really a global independent consulting um, firm. And we try and listen to what our customers need. You know, so whether it is compliance and audit defense, whether um, as we have a lot at the moment, people looking at cost reduction in the Oracle space, or whether they're moving to the cloud or any other um, hybrid scenario, um, we are here to help with uh, Oracle because that's our focus and that's what we do. Outside of that, we have really um, teams and, and people within our organization that has got a very wide and depth knowledge of Oracle. Um, that is uh, quite unique, I would say, to the organization like ours. And um, we also have um, really good technology that we've developed. And most probably our technology is the one thing that is the closest in relation to what Oracle would have. And there's good reason for that, especially when we look at audit scenarios, so that we can give accurate and um, precise um, feedback and information to our clients. But the most important thing about Palisade is that we're totally independent. So that you know that whatever work we do for you remains with you. 
and is for your best interest. And I think that is really important and it resonates with all of our clients worldwide. So with that, um, Craig, would you like to share a little bit about Paliversity? It's quite exciting for us um, to have this service available. Sure, um, you know, over the last eight or nine years, we've helped around 400 clients around the world with their Oracle challenges. And uh, one of the things that has become very apparent is that there are 600,000 Oracle customers that need some help. And there's no way that we could service all of those clients with the level of uh, care uh, that we can do with our consulting practice. So what we've done is we've taken all of our learnings and understandings of Oracle and, and basically put them online into classes that are uh, really impactful for our customers. So we officially rolled out uh, Paliversity in February of this year, although we started the company last year, uh, we went live with the classes that you see here. We've got um, users who are accessing these classes right now. So it's, uh, it's uh, really a benefit for our customers and even our uh, customers who come up, you know, for audit defense and uh, cost reduction, we give them access uh, to Paliversity at times so they can go in and, and begin the self-education process. Uh, the really good thing here is that we're updating the classes regularly. So as Oracle changes, uh, this information stays current and doesn't go stale. So um, that's available today and you can go on paliversity.com and uh, put in a credit card and start taking the classes right away. It's, it's available today. And the beauty of that is um, it bypasses any time zones. Or difficulties that we might have with nights and days. So own, own pace, self-learning. So very, very good initiative and we're very pleased with it. So maybe um, we can start talking about and look at what we mean by Oracle tax. And it's interesting because I suppose the word tax um, is always a negative connotation. It's something that we'll have to pay in some form or shape. Um, and Oracle is actually quite good with um, the taxes that they apply, particularly some that um, just slips through every year without people even noticing that it's there or anticipating that there's that risk. One of the biggest ones that um, we've recently identified and that's becoming quite prominent if we look around the um, pandemic that has affected um, organizations globally is Oracle's um, increases on the annual support cost. And this is a tax. It's something that it, irrespective of whether you've used the support services or um, you know, how much you're paying um, or whether you actually even need support for all the licenses that you're using, you are paying this tax um, unless you've got a contractual ability to pay a lesser fee or pay no fee. And unfortunately with Oracle and their taxes is that um, they don't have a minor sign. Um, you know, this little graphic here is quite interesting, um, chosen by Craig, um, but it's, it's, it's very reflective of how Oracle operates. Um, they like increasing cost. And once you sign a contract, Oracle is quite quick to tell you that it's non cancelable and they don't refund it for the period that you've signed for. So it is an ever increasing fee that you pay. And it happens, um, particularly if you're in a scenario with auto renewals and stuff that you're not even aware of the fees that you pay. And it really, um, you know, drives people as well in, in the time of the year where we're sitting with Oracle's financial year where um, Oracle is trying to close as many deals and has as much of the revenue that they can possibly recognize done before the 31st of May. Now, Craig, you have done a, um, a little bit of an exercise recently around uh, particularly Oracle's inflation adjustment rate. Um, what are sort of the findings that you've um, come to or the conclusions that you've come to with that? Well, there's, there's sort of two ways we've seen Oracle with when we use the word tax, and, and one of them, as you just mentioned, is the, the inflation, uh, the um, currency conversion rate. And that's an interesting one because Oracle's pricing is, is pinned to the US dollar. But if you're not uh, doing business in US dollars, they have to do this currency conversion, obviously throughout APAC uh, that is happening. And it's sort of a secret how Oracle comes up with these numbers and you really can't see, um, it doesn't point to uh, a specific organization's um, currency conversion. And it's, it's something that Oracle can adjust when they need to. So in times of crisis, like we have here, and, and I can say from my experience at Oracle, you know, I lived through the, um, or worked through 
the dot-com bubble bursts that we had in the U.S. in 99, uh, obviously 9-11, and then the financial crisis in 2008, um, Oracle uses these tax levers, as we call them, to generate additional revenue. So they could change the conversion rates, and, and Oracle's fiscal year ends at the end of May. So come June, there could be new conversion rates out there, and then Oracle will make them much more advantageous so that folks outside the U.S. are paying more than they would have with the old conversion rates. Uh, so that's sort of one lever. And then the other, and you, you brought it up, Ben and Rita, was um, the annual support increase. That's tied to inflation. So last year, Oracle's inflationary increase, uh, in, at least in the U.S. and in many countries, was 3%, I think in Australia as well. Uh, this year, it's 4%. So in a time of crisis, in a time when everybody's looking to cut costs, Oracle is able to just tick a box and increase from 3% to 4%. And that could bring in around $200 million a year more for Oracle, which is $200, $200 million a year less in our clients' pockets uh, and, and moved into Oracle's coffers. So uh, these are, are sort of hidden things that people might not even know. Uh, they just you know, see these support renewals and these purchases and they're not looking deeper into how these numbers are calculated. And it's, you know, from an Oracle perspective for them, it's very effective in, in generating revenue. Absolutely. So I think it's safe to say we need to find the minus sign um, for Oracle clients, you know, and, and find ways how we can actually reduce um, those costs and the ever escalation of, of such costs. So um, we've got a poll question um, that we want to raise here. And uh, Craig, maybe I can ask you to um, manage that for us. Sure, the poll question is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your Oracle estate tax fees? Um, so we're trying to really understand how Oracle, uh, if they're reaching out to you, if they've been uh, trying to help you reduce your costs, if they have been if you've reached out to them, if they've been accepting of that. Uh, so we have some interesting uh, feedback from, uh, we've, we did this presentation in the US and Europe, so we've got some numbers there, uh, but interesting to see uh, what other folks think um, in terms of how Oracle is, in, uh, is working with them. So Rana Reed, any guesses where this is gonna end up? How many people do you think Oracle has reached out to? Uh, well, proactively to reduce their fees. <laughs> so we don't have all Oracle's customers, but I would um, safely say out of um, the, the ones that we've got, um, we don't see any proactive reaching out. Um, and when there has been um, comments made about helping, um, when you analyze those, it's not real help. You know, it is, it's uh, not really of real value. So I would say, um, you know, it's business as usual for Oracle rather than maybe making some changes as you would. So, yeah, I think that um, primarily we're seeing that uh, uh, business as usual, or I don't know, is, is where folks are, are coming in here. Uh, but nothing in the first two. Um, the Oracle has reached out or people have been successful sort of um, getting those reductions, which is very consistent with what we saw in North America and, uh, and Europe. I think in, in those polls, uh, we had about 100 people uh, participating, and uh, we had one person in both uh, webinars say that they reached out to Oracle and Oracle actually reduced. Uh, everybody else was, um, Oracle didn't reduce or uh, they haven't even asked. So maybe that one person had a particular requirement or were in negotiations already that Oracle's trying to close before the end of May, if I had to guess. Absolutely. Uh, law of big numbers, you're going to find someone who's successful, but uh, 99 others weren't. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and that actually leads quite well into um, the 31st of May, uh, most probably um, the most important day in the Oracle calendar. And um, from both our times at Oracle, we know the flurry of activity and pressure and stress and uh, bad eating habits and stuff that comes with it being an Oracle. Um, trying to make sure that uh, as much of the business as possibly can close happens at the end of their financial year. And um, from my experience, Oracle most of the time would put that pressure onto their clients, their customers, 
um, trying to um, incite in them the importance of it and making them feel that that is their important day um, and that that is what they need to behave to. And uh, most probably um, this date could be relevant from a strategic perspective if you want to negotiate with Oracle and you want to use Oracle's pressure points um, to, to get a good outcome for you. But in reality, I would say it is Oracle's important date. It is not necessarily your important date. And there's many ways that Oracle tries and makes this important to you. Um, one of the ways that I see quite often is if there is an opportunity um, on the table for Oracle and it's not moving fast enough to get it closed by the end of May, oftentimes Oracle would use um, sort of um, sometimes very obvious, but sometimes the, uh, more hidden threats of audits, you know, if you don't do this by this time. And in actual fact, I've just been contacted um, by a company in our region here that says that um, Oracle is trying to move them to the cloud, to sign a cloud contract before the end of May. And they are not sure that that's the right direction for them to take. And the second thing that they now heard is that they got a threat that they're going to be audited if they don't do this deal by the end of May. So Craig, do you see any other sort of tactics that you know is, sounds familiar that we hear year after year? Well, it's always amazing to me that um, Oracle is really good at making their problems your problems, right? So May 31st is, is problematic for the Oracle salesperson because on June 1st, they might have different accounts or they might not be employed by Oracle anymore if they're not uh, doing very well. Um, or their sales compensation, they make more money if you sign the deal on May 31st versus June 1st because of where they are in their quota. So Oracle salespeople are really good about taking all of their problems and dumping it on their customers and saying, now they're your problem. So you have to get this done by May 31st or something really bad is gonna happen. Um, and, and that is um, something we're, we're constantly trying to uh, turn the tables on and, and have customers view uh, May 31st as an opportunity. And my favorite line, that we advise customers is to, to, when Oracle sales keeps pushing May 31st, and we write this down for customers, I'm like, I want you to say this exactly like this. I want you to say to, the, to your sales rep, how are you going to feel when the next sales rep on my account gets your commission because I signed this deal in June? Because you won't give me what I need to sign this deal in May. Uh, and that's an amazing statement to sort of turn the tables, to really say to Oracle, no, uh, May 31st means nothing to me. Uh, that's your problem. I care about June 1st because that's when there's a reset. And, um, you know, if I need to work with someone new on this deal to get the deal that I want, uh, then I will. So just trying to pivot people's attention one day later. So Oracle stops focusing on May 31st and you get them to focus on June 1st. Oracle, what happens if I sign this deal on June 1st? I'll tell you, Oracle is going to take their money in June, right? If, if, they, if there's a, a deal that slips from May 31st and a customer wants to sign it in June because uh, for whatever reason, Oracle will take that money in June. I mean, Anarita, have you ever seen Oracle not take a deal in June? Uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's a very interesting statement because we see this year after year after year. It, Oracle behaves as if there's no life after 31st of May, that the world is going to come to an end on the 31st of May. And yet all that really happens is that the clock is reset. You know, they have to do business again for the new year um, and uh, they will be driving and they will be doing. And I will even venture to say that as we speak, they are strategizing and working as to what happens at the beginning of Q1 of the next financial year. So um, it is more so a sales strategy. And I mean, fair enough, um, that is the end of the financial year and we all measure by our financial year calendars, you know, and, and as far as the viability of our businesses are concerned, and Oracle is very good at managing that. But that is their problem, um, as you stated, you know, it's, it's not the customer's problem. Um, so most probably if you're finding yourself right now, and um, we've got a week or two to go before uh, end of May, and you want to utilize um, this period of um, activity and where you have Oracle's attention, especially if um, they are the belief that there's some money there for them that they can uh, close out uh, in this financial year. Uh, there's some three key negotiation things to think about when you negotiate with Oracle. And the most important one, and this is one that you will often hear us in Palisade talk about, is that you need to be in control. You need to have 
the ability to know what you want and how you want it and what the end result is that you want to achieve. If you allow Oracle to be the driver, if they're the puppet master, they're just going to be pulling your strings to where they want you to go. You need to switch those around and you need to become in control. So you have to negotiate from a position of strength. And whether that is from a commercial aspect, your contracts aspect, your usage of the licenses, whatever, all of that needs to be in a place where you are comfortable that you know um, where you stand and what it means for you. And you also need to think about what will happen worst case scenario. And I'm a big um, supporter of worst case scenarios because I think once you have taken the sting out of the worst case and you have a plan and you know what it means for you, it gives you the ability to make better decisions. So knowing what the cost is if you don't do this deal. Now, recently, one of our clients um, that is in a negotiation have been told that um, there is going to be increases and in stuff um, in the pricing, as Craig has said, with the exchange rates um, and the, the um, calculations that Oracle does that is going to make it more expensive. Now, you know, my comment is if you're going to buy licenses now that you are not clear about whether you really need them or you need those quantities or you need that particular functionality, it is not a good buy for you, irrespective if you're getting it at a better price, because you're going to be locked in at least for the next 12 months with support. And as we all know, it's notoriously difficult to get out of Oracle's contracts. So knowing and being sure that the worst case is not rather your better case in this scenario is of great importance for you. you know? And this is the time to really do that homework and make sure that you know that this is a valuable deal for you. And then some other good advice here is look at other alternatives. You know, Oracle will tell you there is only Oracle. And the more of the red stack that they can sell you and the more they can lock you in, the harder it is for you to change. And the more of Oracle you've got, the slower the, the wheels turn to make changes to that. So when you are looking at solutions or changes that you need to make or additional license that you need to buy or particularly at functionalities and stuff, look for other alternatives. And even if you don't go towards that, it's a good negotiation point with Oracle if you have alternatives um, and uh, you know, not just in pricing, but also in options that can put additional pressure on Oracle. And then you want to make sure, sorry, Greg. Well, I was just going to uh, sort of jump in there on the alternatives because we've seen that um, actually today, I was advising a client on that. And when we talk about alternatives, it's, as you said, it's not just alternative products to Oracle. Although if you have an alternative uh, solution, it's great. You can play one vendor off the other, but it's just an alternative to what Oracle wants you to do. So if, for example, Oracle is trying to push you to sign an unlimited license agreement, a ULA, and it's going to be millions of dollars, um, and, you and you have no alternative because you're out of compliance, you're much more likely to sign that versus if you're in compliance and maybe you need those licenses in six months, but now you're in a position of strength, maybe you don't need the ULA. Maybe you could sign uh, for a number of users in six months and so you hold on to your money at, at the time. So I think those alternatives, I, you know, I don't want folks to think it's, it's just alternatives to Oracle. It's just alternatives to what Oracle wants you to do. So it might not be signing a deal in May. It might be signing it in October. It might not be a ULA. It might be a named user deal. Um, it might not be uh, UCC, you know, universal cloud credits. You might want to buy cloud in, in a different way then Oracle wants you to buy it. So as long as you have the control and you don't have to buy something, you're definitely gonna get a better deal than um, those folks who, uh, who are forced to buy it because of some reason that, you know, like a compliance issue. Maybe to just add to that, um, we often see that Oracle also doesn't share with um, their customers the various pricing options that are available for the same solution or the same outcome. So um, a ULA is a very good one for Oracle because it's uh, easier for them to sell and it's higher dollars. But you could potentially look at something like a custom application bundle. You can buy named users. You can buy standalone processes. There's a lot of different ways. Um, Oracle will always go for the one that is most advantageous for them. And they will try and get the focus only on that one. So just looking, as Craig says, at different options available, um, whether it's within Oracle or however, um, is a very good uh, position to have because then you can negotiate the best outcome for you. And Rita, have you seen, because I've noticed this in other regions, sometimes the Oracle salespeople or the Oracle audit people 
they just don't know what the options are. They don't have the experience. Like you and I have been doing this for so many years. We've seen so much, but Oracle churns and burns for their sales teams, or they've taken a lot of the audit uh, expertise out of country and moved it into Romania, that you're dealing often with junior people who they don't know there's another licensing way. They're sort of given a script to follow and they can't veer off it. So it's not even that they're trying to put pressure on, but I've just noticed that they just don't know. So we actually spend some of our time educating Oracle on their support policies and matching support and repricing and, and all of those things. And, and they often have to go back and, and sort of, you know, go back to the manager in the other room and say, is this really true? Do you see that in APAC as well? Absolutely. In actual fact, one of our clients um, that um, was in a difficult situation that Oracle um, said they can't do, and they were actually in their situation, uh, all their support was with a third party, and um, they had to host licenses for a, a separate entity that they provide services to. And Oracle said to that they can't buy licenses for that particular project until they bring all of their licenses back onto support. And my comment to that was, no, there is a, an option in Oracle where you can buy licenses that is referred to as licenses for a specified end user. So you don't have rights to the licenses, but it's for a particular purpose and they stand separate from your own licenses, although you buy them. Um, so she went back with that to Oracle and said, that's what I want. And they said, no, you can't do it. That doesn't exist. So um, she came back to me and I gave her the exact wording and I also referred to where they will find it. And um, her comment back, because they came back quickly after that and said, oh, oh yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, she came back with a comment. Isn't it amazing that you know more about Oracle than Oracle knows about themselves? So yes, we do, we do see that type of stuff happening you know, in this region too. And in, in some ways, um, you know, it makes our uh, life a little bit harder um, you know, as consultants in the space um, because uh, we, we're dealing with people that should know that don't. Um, but on the other hand, um, there's also opportunities in there, you know, when, when Oracle doesn't know, you know, from one line of business to another or was in particular parts of the business, you know, how their business actually operates. So we use that for our customers' benefit. Um, then the other thing that we see happen quite a lot um, and that uh, is often used as well towards this gearing of closing transactions and stuff uh, at the end of May is around um, Oracle's stealth audits. Now, most people are not even aware when there's a stealth audit happening because we are only familiar with an audit letter that is given to you. But a stealth audit can take on a lot of different um, aspects. And again, yeah, I had a customer that contacted us and said, oh, um, Oracle said X, Y, and Z to me. And I said to him, I'm sending you one of our white papers about stealth audits, you know, have a read through it um, while we prepare some other discussions and stuff. He actually came back to me and he says, and he says, as if they've read your document because page this and this and this, it's exactly <laughs> to me, you know, so um, stealth audits can happen in many different forms. It can even happen through partners of Oracle or resellers. You know, it could be when um, your a business unit is looking for some information on a product and Oracle comes back and asks for, um, you know, sharing some of your internal business um, operations or setups with them that actually gets audited or that goes through the audit team. And those things um, often can create visibility or leverage for Oracle. And, and unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that information that Oracle got um, is not necessarily accurate because Oracle is very good at asking obscure questions that they get a response to that they then act on that is actually not accurate. You know, not because the person gave inaccurate information is because they responded to what was asked of them. And we see that during official audits as well. And that's why a lot of times there are errors or, or misrepresentation of compliance. So be aware of these um, types of ways that Oracle can audit you or try and audit you and know your rights and how to deal you know, with some of these requests and stuff. And we'll touch a little bit on that um, just after this. Um, so in the next uh, section, um, I sort of want to talk about four particular areas, and you might find yourself in one or in multiple um, of these um, at the moment in your dealings with Oracle, and we're going to deal with them one by one. And again, Craig, if there's anything that you feel you want to add, feel free to do so. But first, let's talk a little bit about contract negotiations. If you are in a situation today where you have to negotiate a contract with Oracle or you're already in that process, 
here's a couple of tips and things to think about um, during these negotiations. And the first one is, um, you know, in my experience with Oracle, while I was at Oracle and in uh, where I am now, is that Oracle, because of all of the red tapes and the approval processes, and um, there's a lot of cumbersome things that happens within Oracle, will take a phenomenally long time to actually get a contract in front of you. You know, they're very quick at uh, um, offering something to you and making you all kinds of um, uh, promises as to what they can do for you or what it would look like. But to get that actual contract in front of you takes a long time. And once you've got that contract, um, Oracle wants you to respond within two or three days, get it signed off. They ignore the fact that you might also have a lot of red tape and processes you have to go through. And they do this oftentimes so that um, it has very limited opportunity for you to negotiate or to work through that contract to make sure that that is acceptable to you. So one of the first bits of advice is, is get a word version of the contract as soon as possible and push Oracle for that. You know, they, they have to give you that. So that it's easier for you and you have time to review it and to redline it and to negotiate um, from, a, from a, a perspective. Now, the better advice is to have your own contract and your own position as to where you want to go. Um, and that is, would be my first bit of advice is to say, you know, you know what you want to have as your terms and conditions. You know what you want to buy because we're taking the assumption that you're in control and you know uh, what your uh, obligations are and what you need to do. So have a strategy and have a plan before you even talk to Oracle. But get that document, have the ability to redline and work with it. And then have your own time frame. Work out what's going to work for you. And again, if 31st of May is advantageous for you to strategically negotiate to get the best deal for Oracle and it works for you, by all means. But you control that. And make sure that Oracle knows that you're in control, that there is life after the 31st of May. So, Anna Rita, those two points I think are really intertwined because, you know, if I think about uh, Oracle's Q4, this is March, April, and May, it's about 90 days. And if you start talking to Oracle at the beginning of March, you might not get a contract from them until May 25th or May 20th. And from March 1st till May 20th, you're going back and forth on PowerPoints. And then you finally get the contract in front of you. And lo and behold, it's different than what was in the PowerPoint. It's just not what you expected. There are surprises, there are gotchas, there are oh by the ways in there that you just were not expecting. Or even, you know, you talked about red tape for Oracle. The salesperson is talking to the client and then the salesperson has to take that information and send it to someone else who approves it and put some comments on it, who sends it to someone else, who drafts a contract, who maybe sends it to an attorney. And by the time it comes back to the salesperson, it might be different than the, what that salesperson created or requested, sorry. So you need that time. And unfortunately, the way Oracle negotiates, you have to go through these cycles where you get a document and you redline it and you go back to Oracle. And then the more cycles you have with Oracle, the more concessions you will get. So if you have one cycle and you get this contract on May 25th and you have to review it within your legal team and come back to red and you only have one chance to go back to Oracle, you might have 30 things that you want changed, but you only get two of them. If you have time to do 10 or 15 cycles, not that anybody wants to do that, um, but you'll get more concessions. And again, putting that calendar in front of Oracle and, and forcing them say, listen, we're giving you a week to give us a draft, and then it takes us a week to review it. The, the time of you taking 30 days to give us a contract, and then we have 24 hours to get it back to you, which is typically how these things work if customers don't assert themselves, uh, those are over. So Oracle, if you take longer, then all of a sudden this May 31st deadline now becomes June 5th or June 7th or June 13th. So um, take the Oracle schedule that they give you because they're very good about giving you a schedule saying this is how you will sign this deal. It's, it's your buying process, not their selling process. That's important. And you, you rip that up, you put it in the wastebasket and you give Oracle your schedule. So here's how it's going to work. If you want me to give you my money, here's what you need to do Oracle. And just 
even the playing field, level it out to make sure you both have time. You want a meeting of the minds. You want both parties to understand what's in these documents and what you're signing up to. Um, and you just don't want to be in that position where you have to turn something around. And so many times I've heard customers say, well, we just signed it because it was the last minute and we really didn't look at that document. And just, you know, that's, that's tough two years later when you're being audited and Oracle wants millions of dollars more. So. And uh, maybe just to add to that is um, Oracle is very good at putting the focus on the dollars and, and making the whole conversation and negotiation around the dollars. We oftentimes, um, when we have to help someone with their contract, it is so important that the contract is actually a good contract. You know, that the terms and stuff that's in the contract is good for you and how your business is going to operate. And part of the reason I often think Oracle, apart from the fact that it's difficult for them to get through that whole process, as you say, in the cycles that they need to go through and that they might often get pushed back on stuff that they ask for, um, is that they would rather avoid it than ask for it if they can. And secondly, as well as some of those gray areas that they leave that is not covered in a standard contract of Oracle creates opportunity for them in the future to upsell or to sell you something. And, and one of the things that comes to my mind immediately is um, M&A activity or, you know, customer definitions, territory, stuff like that, that Oracle will just be silent on because they know that down the track after that contract is signed, they potentially have the opportunity to come and ask for more money. So that's why those terms and stuff becomes really important for you long term rather than just the price. So, Anna Rita, we've got about uh, 20 minutes left with Q&A at the end. So I think we've got to hit the gas here. Because <laughs> cool. we could talk about this all day, you and I. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've got lots of um, history. So support renewals, again, if you're um, to, uh, wanting to manage your support renewals and whether it is because you're under pressure for the end of May or uh, long term or after, is really make sure that you're not in Oracle's auto renew process. Now, you, you can get out of it if you are, um, and we can help you with doing that because it's not very obvious and Oracle has specific requirements how to get out of it. But auto renewal is a danger, particularly when we talk about Oracle's hidden taxes that we discussed earlier on, because that auto renewal will happen, the costs will be added to it, and it will be renewed before you can say Jiminy Cricket and you will be locked in for the next 12 months. So really important for you to make sure that you keep control so that you can review, make sure it's accurate. We oftentimes find that either the wrong percentage have been added, the wrong products are in there, something has been dropped off from the previous year or stuff goes wrong. So make sure that you don't have it in a process where you don't have any control over it. And look at your options around support, you know, whether you can reduce organically support, whether, um, you know, there's options for you to maybe outsource the support, whatever, around the support cost ongoing and making sure that you've got sufficient support um, for your requirements is, is good advice, I would say. And there's many ways that you can look at it. And uh, we've got a bit of a playbook that we can also help you with on the support side. Anything to add, Craig? I think the investigating alternatives is, is really important here, especially if you are um, using some legacy products. We've seen uh, customers, you have to do it at the right time, they're moving off of Oracle PeopleSoft and they're moving to Workday, for example, and it's going to take two years. So they, you know, stop paying Oracle all that money for support and use a third party support provider like Rumini Street and they pay half and they take that savings and they invest it in their, their new, uh, their future, their digital transformation. Um, so really looking at the products that you're using with Oracle and how, how many of those are going to be long term and stay with you um, and there are easy ways to move to alternative Oracle support models um, if, you know, if you have the right product stack. So I definitely recommend that. Uh, we've helped lots of customers sort of make that transition and they never look back. So uh, that, that's, a, that's a game changer for some companies, right? It really reduces it by half. Absolutely. So the next bit we'll look at um, end of year list. We know there's a lot of them um, due end of May and then also beyond that. Um, so a little bit of advice around dealers when you want to negotiate those. It's always good to look at these in the same um, in parallel uh, in, uh, as far as whether you want to look at understanding how you can optimize it in the event that you want to certify out. 
if you want to renegotiate a new EULA or even negotiate a whole brand new um, EULA. And EULA, for those who might not know on the call, stands for Unlimited License Agreement, um, Oracle's favorite way of selling licenses. Um, so run those things in tandem and you can do that until the day that you have to certify in reality. The end of ULA. So yeah, make sure again, remain in control. Um, make sure that you really fully utilize your unlimited grant during the period that you have it because that's really the value that you get out of an unlimited and for the um, large fee that you might have paid for it. And take ownership of this process. Um, I don't know, Craig, in um, the other regions, but here in APAC, we oftentimes see it where um, Oracle tries and takes this process outside of the contract and trying to impose certain requirements or steps um, or implications on um, organizations that, you know, is not contained in their contract. I don't know if you see that as well. Happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this goes back to your previous slide where we talked about stealth audits. This is, you know, one of the big drivers of those stealth audits where um, about a year uh, or six months before a ULA expires, the Oracle sales team will get the Oracle audit team involved. And it's a, always a friend, it's very friendly at first. And they'll approach the client and say, you have to do this. You have to fill out this form. You have to give us some. It's very clear from your contract, the customer certifies themselves. They certify. It's up to the customer to certify. Their numbers are what count. But Oracle will put in there, like, no, you have to use our form. No, you have to give us the information. No, you have. So we've helped more than one customer who followed Oracle's guidance and got a big audit bill at the end. You know, there's no one at Oracle who will truly help you certify. They are there to help you buy more Oracle and move to Oracle Cloud. So if you really want to certify, you really need to take ownership of that. Uh, we do also have some case studies on this um, on our website that folks can see, you know, actually what happened with real customers who sort of went down this path, but really important uh, to take control of that whole process. And it could be a more than a year, right? If you're, we have customers now whose ULAs expire in May of 2021, and Oracle is trying to upsell them to renew it now, and it just doesn't make any sense uh, because you're giving away a whole year of leverage and additional pricing pressure that they can put on Oracle. And we've also in our region, particularly in Asia, have had um, a couple of cases where Oracle have made certain statements um, around the EULAs that um, customers have uh, and requiring them to buy additional licenses, um, although they've got unlimited right to it during that period by trying to um, state that certain stuff is excluded where it isn't, you know. So um, really being in control and managing that process, I think is, is quite important for anyone. And you want to get the best value out of it. Your return on investment needs to be the best that you possibly can. Because for me personally, that's the only time that a EULA is of advantage for you is if you can get benefit um, out for, for what you spend, because you're actually buying in advance, um, you know, licenses. That's how Oracle prices. Are. And then lastly, um, yeah, it's just around order defense. Um, if you are being threatened with an audit or going through an audit, um, any, any form or shape, stealth or otherwise, um, but particularly official audits, uh, make sure that you're again in control of that. Um, and if you don't have the ability to uh, manage it, you know, get help um, to help you through it. Uh, all of the cases that I've had in all of these years um, with Oracle audits is that those audits are incorrect. And some of that goes back to some of the comments, Craig, you made earlier on about the processes that Oracle have or that people aren't really um, upskilled to do a particular work or they just told um, parent like you know to do certain things and they don't ask or they don't do a thorough investigation and oftentimes audits are not based on customers contracts but um, behavior outside of that that Oracle would like to um, deploy or use so make sure that Oracle sticks to your contracts in the first instance the second that you're in control of that but most probably the best advice that I can give is to be in charge. Know what you are using and how you're using it long before Oracle comes and audits you and keep that control. Because if you know what is happening in your environment, Oracle, first of all, don't like auditing people who are in control because they're auditing you so that they can get more money. They're not auditing you to, to confirm that you are compliant. So if you're in control of it and Oracle knows that you're in control of it, and you have done your homework and you're correctly using the licenses, you do not have 
risk of um, audits or fear for an audit over you. You know, um, you can manage it and you can be in control. And the other bit of advice, a little bit of plug for Palisade, but you know, to work proactively with customers before they are audited, you know, and, and doing that in a quick uh, manner so that you know what is going to happen in the next step before Oracle knows it or anyone else knows it. Not only does it give you the advantage of um, knowledge and insight, but it also gives you the ability to address matters that can be addressed um, ethically and contractually correctly. So be in control of any audit um, you know, that comes your way uh, and make sure that Oracle sticks to your contract. Yeah, the um, knowing the answer before Oracle, I think is, 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 is critical there. You never want to, in any situation, any audit, you know, not forget Oracle, you never want to give information to a vendor and then you're just waiting. We're going to wait for them to tell us we're in compliance. Um, it's really important that you know first. It doesn't matter what the answer is, whether you're in compliance or out of compliance. Um, if you're out of compliance, you have to give Oracle more money. Okay, but if you know that answer first and you can position yourself properly, you're going to give them a lot less money than if Oracle finds it out before you. So uh, good or bad, you just want to know that answer. I mean, that is so important. And it's so frustrating sometimes when we hear from companies like they're in an audit. Like, I'm just waiting for Oracle to give me the results. I'm like, why aren't you giving Oracle the results? Like you should be telling them what your position is. Um, so you're, you're using the software, not them. Absolutely. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, other than our slight Zoom glitches um, and uh, intruders that we've had, um, we appreciate that you have um, stayed the course with us. And as mentioned in the onset of this uh, session, if anyone would like to um, subscribe to Palaversity, uh, we offer you a 10% discount if you put in the word Oracle Tax uh, in the promotion code, and that is, will be available to you until the 15th of May. Um, feel free to make use of that. Um, you know, it is self-learning, uh, and you can do it in your own time. Um, from my side, that is it. Um, I know that we have asked some when they register to post some questions, um, anything that they would like us to answer. So, and um, you could also have done it during the session. So I don't know, Craig, if you've got visibility to any of those questions and if there's any there that we can answer for. Uh, I do, I do. Um, so there's still an opportunity. If you have questions, you can submit them now in the little question uh, Q&A box at the bottom. Um, here's one. Half of our support contracts will no longer be used next year. How can we terminate them if we are still using the other half? Oh, that's a good question. You or me, Craig? <laughs> go, go for it. So uh, um, if I read your question correctly, it sounds to me like you have um, separate support contracts. And if that is the case, there are often ways, um, and as I've mentioned before, we've got a bit of a playbook on this, that you can reduce cost. The important thing is, is to determine what you are really using um, and what you are not using and then working out a strategy or a plan but definitely there are options, particularly if you have multiple support contracts or even multiple contracts. You could have one support renewal, but multiple ordering documents. There are ways to help and assist you to do so. And um, just a side comment on this. Uh, oftentimes, Oracle, when you do approach them about reducing support costs, will throw the repricing policy in your face as one of the technical support policy uh, practices. And that's not necessarily always a bad thing. We've just recently helped a customer and their reprice actually was to their benefit in majority of the contracts. And the one where it wasn't, actually it was outweighed with the cost savings on the others. So don't let Oracle's pushbacks um, let you throw in the towel or just turn away. But um, whoever raised this question, happy to also have that conversation with you specifically to your situation to see if we can help. Well, this interesting, um, and I think we know where customers, um, their heads are, because um, there's several questions which sort of have the same um, tenor to, to the one we just read. So let me just read you these three in a row. Is there a way, number one, is there a way to freeze the perpetual support fee and avoid the year over year increase? Um, the second is sort of related, how much does the renewal of support increase each year? And the third is, how can I reduce maintenance given the COVID-19 pandemic? So those are sort of all questions geared towards reducing support. So I think um, 
let's start with that last question. How can I reduce maintenance given the COVID-19 pandemic? We have a client who we've worked with on and off since 2013. We helped them through an audit. They had some leadership changes. We helped them through another challenge that they had with Oracle. Um, and then they went away for a few years and they, they came back two weeks ago. And uh, they're a retail firm. And in their country, stores are closed. So their revenue is down 80% versus where it was last year. And they spend millions of dollars a year with Oracle. And they went to Oracle and said, hey, Oracle, here's the situation. We have no money. Our revenue is down 80%. We spend millions of dollars with you. No one's using the software because we're not in the stores. Uh, can you help me reduce it? And Oracle said, no, we're not going to. As a matter of fact, we're going to increase. Uh, not only do the year-over-year -year increase, but we're increasing the increase. So it was, again, we talked about this before. It used to be 3%, but your, your $3 million bill or $3, $3 million bill with Oracle uh, is now going to be $3 million plus 4%. Um, so really no help. And again, if you put yourself in the position of that Oracle salesperson, there's no incentive for them to give you a break on your support bill. So um, there are ways to reduce those costs, as, as Anna Rita said. We do have a playbook, about 10 different ways. Um, and we look at it sort of as a three-step process. The first step is you have to stop spending more money with Oracle. So how can we stop the bleeding, um, stop the increases? Then you look at how to reduce, right? Customers often want to go right to reducing. And sometimes that's not the best option. Sometimes you want to do a two-step. It might take you a year to get there. And then the third step in that savings process is just protecting your savings, right? Unless you're going to move off Oracle completely and not have any dealings with them, uh, there's always a chance that they could come back and audit you and sort of challenge you to, to repay those fees or to increase your support down, down the line. Um, but you definitely want to have a programmatic approach. Look at your uh, the totality of your Oracle estate and environment uh, and find out. I'm working one right now. They've got seven different support contracts with Oracle and we're picking out a strategy on each specific support contract on how that one will either be reduced or flatlined. And there is always a way, there is always a way to reduce your Oracle spend. Uh, it's just a matter of whether or not you want to do it. Um, and I've got one more question, Anna Rita, uh, and then time's up. And I'll leave this one to you. How aggressive will Oracle sales be to close deals before uh, 531, before May 31st? Um, I'm going to be a little bit flippant and say short of becoming physical, they'll be very aggressive. <laughs> uh, um, we see that, and it's, it's every year, this sort of similar behavior, might be different names, but similar behavior. That's um, sort of an Oracle culture, and they're known for that. So Oracle will become very aggressive. I think... Um, most probably the best way of dealing with this is, is to not quiver at the aggression. Um, one of our clients got an email from Oracle where everything was in capitals in red. You know, um, they really, really became um, very aggressive with this particular customer. And um, my advice would be is, is to just remain calm and remain in control. You know, at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't get aggressive back, it becomes very difficult, you know, to get a result out of it. So um, the reality is, and, and it, it surprises me how much power um, organizations and individuals give Oracle, you know, and, and how scared they can be of Oracle, where they're just a company, you know, just like you and like anybody else, and you have just as much rights. So unless you are finding yourself in a compromised position, which is a whole different matter, um, you know, stand up to Oracle, you know, don't allow the um, stresses and strains, you know, be a problem for you. So just manage it. But they will get, particularly if um, that particular rep is not going to make his number or um, if he's, you know, and, and I would venture to say at this point, Oracle is most probably also suffering from COVID-19 and the impact of that. Um, the numbers of deals that they're going to close at the end of this year is most probably down from what they anticipated. Um, so, you know, you can expect that there'll, there'll be a lot of um, stress and strain that coming from their side. But again, it's not your deadline. 
It is not your requirement. You need to be true to your organization and do what is right um, for you, uh, not for Oracle. That's terrific. Great advice, Anna Rita. And I think we are out of time and out of questions. Ah, oh, that was well planned then. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, appreciate it. If any of you are interested in uh, any further conversations, um, we're happy to have one-on-one -on -one, um, discussing maybe more in detail your specific requirements. Um, on the slide, you can see you uh, have a generic email address that you can send um, a response to. You can go to our website. And as Craig has mentioned early on, we've got um, a lot of case studies um, and white papers that uh, could relate to a scenario that you're finding yourself in. So feel free to avail yourself to any of those. And again, thank you for your time. Have a good day. And it was a pleasure to talk to all of you. Thank you, Craig, for your time too. Thanks. Thank you, Anarita. Have a good day, everyone.